God. And you managed to sequence the DNA of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And I've, I've got to know how you negotiated that. I presume <laughs> you didn't turn up and say, I'm here with a swab your eminence, have you got to spare 10 minutes? It must have been a, a, a difficult process. Oh, I, I turned up with a needle instead. Okay. But, but um, uh, it was a long process. Um, but the Archbishop was very aware of what human genomics was bringing to the medical world. And he wanted his people and indigenous people around the world to be part of it. So um, that so part was easy. Well, with someone like Desmond Tudor, did you ask him or did you ask his people? How, how did he even find out about the request? I asked him, yeah. yes. When did you meet? <laughs> um, I was fortunate to meet the Archbishop um, during the when apartheid came to an end. And uh, we had a, a, a celebration in the Botanical Gardens in South Africa, which actually is the site where um, colonialism began because it was the vegetable garden for the ship sailors coming from the Dutch East Indian Company. So it was a rightful place to meet him. But um, I met him at that time and whether he remembers, he says he remembers that meeting. Um, we were just trying to raise money for charity. That's actually what we were doing in the gardens, and he participated in that um, with us. It was the last time I ever saw him with a bodyguard, actually. He's never been with a bodyguard since. Um, I just wrote to him. He answered me directly. And then what process went from well. there? There must have been discussion, to and fro, negotiating. Yes, um, so it was a long protocol, and, uh, and then he put his own team together, um, three professors, from three different institutions uh, in, in the country. And he brought us together in his office with the Archbishop, and I brought my team together um, from Penn State and from the University of Limpopo in South Africa. And we sat in his office, and they drilled us. And uh, after one hour, told him, you should not do this project. His, his advisor said yes, no? Yes, absolutely no. Yes. What did he and say? He turned around and said, I'm not only going to say yes, I'm going to say ya. Yeah. And that was important because that's the Afrikaans word for yes, which was um, the apartheid-based language. So he wanted to say that we're going to bring everybody together and we will do this for South Africa. And the, I'll say it in that, in that language too. The discussions you had with his advisors, were they what people in diplomatic circles call uh, uh, frank, robust discussions? It was an interrogation, yes. <laughs> is the only way I can say. And it led to such a heated um, interrogation between my colleague at the University of Limpopo, which is an unnamed university in the sense that uh, it was uh, an African university, and, uh, and one of his advisors that the archbishop had to jump out of his chair and say, gentlemen, I won the peace prize, no fighting in my office. <laughs> <laughs> what was it that swung the deal? Was, it, was there something that made the archbishop say yes to this? Um, I think what swung the deal really was integrity. He was assessing our integrity, why we were doing that was number one. The second thing was the fact that it was the University of Limpopo sitting there. It was an underprivileged university that was going to be empowered by this project. Not exactly one of the places that's on the Times, exactly. higher education supplement, top Ex five universities in the world. Exactly. And, and, and the most important reason was he was tired of indigenous uh, people and his people in his country being left out of medical research, just plain and simple. He said, we get the last draw, the Human Genome Project was almost 10 years finished by that time, and still there was no African genome. And uh, yet how many, even since our publication um, just over a year ago now, we still only have three published African genomes and two came from our paper. When, when you then. look at his DNA, can you tell that it's Nobel Prize oh, winning absolutely. DNA? <laughs> <laughs> he got quite shocked because I, um, in, a, in one of our meetings, I, I made sure that I had, and I didn't tell you this, dried mango and rum and raisin ice cream. And he said, how did you know I like that? And he said, I, saw it, I said, I saw it in your DNA. <laughs> no. Actually, actually, his uh, secretary told me that. But, um, <laughs> what, what, what did you impressed. see in his DNA? But what what I did, did we did see you? in his DNA that really um, blew his mind was um, we discovered something that he didn't know, that he had an ancestry to the Kusa and to the click-speaking Bushman people um, of Southern Africa. And that was highly significant for him because um, it truly meant that he represented the land and represented the people from that area. Because remember, he's a Bantu speaker, which means he actually is, from a long time ago, a migrant to the area. 
And how he tells the story um, was when, when I told him, I, get, I phoned him actually, because I wanted to tell him personally about this, because I didn't know how he would react, is he told me the story about um, when he left South Africa to do his theological studies overseas, um, he, they couldn't give him a passport because no African got any passport. So the government didn't know what to do. This, this person had been given a bursary to study in Oxford and, and, and they didn't, didn't know how he could travel. So after a lot of negotiation, they gave him a travel document. And on the travel document, and he still got it, it says national, nationality or race, undeterminable at present. So he wasn't given even um, an identity in his own document. And so for him to be able to say, I'm actually of this people. I'm not only a Kosa and a Mutswana, I can also say, I'm a Kusan. I'm actually from this land and you're not. Could, could you work out how far back in his family branches had gone in certain directions? Yeah, we, we worked it out to be about, um, about five or six generations back. And it was very embracing for him because his mother, he now realized, looked very Kusan. And when he met um, the Kusan lady who came to our celebration, he couldn't stop hugging her because she reminded him of, of well, he hugs everybody, but <laughs> she, remi she reminded him so much of his mother who's passed. 